Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Hi there, I am Angelo Ponzi, your host at the Business Growth Cafe, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Each week we select from a menu of topics that can impact your business. Um, and today I'm excited to have Nancy Drew, health and wellness expert, motivational speaker on our show uh, to discuss employee productivity and well-being. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Right. Before we get started, let's take a few minutes and, and maybe tell the audience um, about your company and how your service is going to have an impact on business growth. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. My company is uh, it's called Happy and Healthy, and it focuses on uh, employees being happy and healthy at work. You know, And so my job is to create cost-effective programs that make the employees happier and improve the you know their health at the same time. Uh, what how that helps companies is that there's a huge cost to having unhappy employees. You know how much you get done when you don't mm -hmm. really feel like it. You're not productive and turnover is high. Um, health expenses are out of control. Uh, there's absenteeism. So when a, a company has a culture of happiness and people enjoy being there, it's just the best competitive advantage that you can have. Right. There's certainly, uh, obviously, increasing productivity as you go along because of that happiness. So, you know, in a, in a recent Gallup uh, survey, about 70% of American workers are unhappy or simply disengaged in their jobs. And, and according to the survey, actually about 20% even hate their jobs. So how are companies really dealing with this issue to ensure their disengaged workers are not impacting their bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a huge issue because um, happy workers don't stay, or sorry, unhappy workers don't stay. So what the stat is right now in the U.S. is that 89% of companies have a corporate wellness or a health and wellness program of some kind. And, you know, they, they take different forms and they do see a return on investment. That's what people are looking for is it, does it pay for itself? The answer is yes, it does. And, you know, for a corporate wellness program, and that's what we help people do is kind of find out what is happening right now, how, what's the temperature of the employees, are they going to stay, are they going to go, are they engaged, you know, how productive are they, and create programs that are helpful. So how do you establish that base, right? Is that through an employee mm -hmm. survey or what, what's kind of the, the, your first steps to help evaluate a company of their, their employee happiness, if mm -hmm. you will? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we do do is we do do a, a survey. So some of it, it's a self-reporting with the um, an anonymous survey with the employees. We do some one-on-one -on -one interviewing. We get uh, data from the HR group, and and you know we really don't suggest change for the sake of change. Right. You know, right. there's got to be something connect it, something factual on this. And then we roll that up for the company and we say, okay, here's here's where we're, we're busy and not productive. Here's where the opportunities are. So we calculate, you know, the hours, the, um, the, the cost in wages, um, possibly, you know, we're looking at, you know, a lot of times they're paying way too much on their health care costs because they don't have programs like this in place. And those, and those kinds of programs help drive down in, in, in health care costs, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Yeah. Like for one company, um, they have had a, uh, what is their savings? $136 per employee per month on their health care costs. You wow. know, reduction. So it's it's significant. The do you typically working with HR and, and and I always look at you know how much does senior management the C suite get involved in this or is this really at the kind of the the managerial level that are helping to drive this and of course uh, and then the C suite is happy when they see cost reduction. So who gets involved in 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 helping to implement these programs? Well. To be perfectly honest, you know, typically the health and wellness program is dumped on the HR desk and okay. say, hey, you know, do something. And then those poor people are thinking, gosh, you know, we're not a health person. We're not a, a nutritionist. We, you know, what do we do? And they have to try to create a program. And that's a tough, a tough deal for them. Um, ideally, where it comes in and, and when it works out best is when the senior leadership says, hey, you know what? 
this is something that we want to we want to do. It's our why. You know, it's about having a workforce that is engaged and happy and taking care of the families and the health of our employees because we know if they're taken care of, then they're going to take care of the business. Right. They're going to take care of the customers. So it really needs to be at the top opposed to maybe, you know, sometimes we get the very odd person that is um, says, well, you know, I want to email you on a weekend. I'm going to email you on the weekend. If I want to call you in on a Sunday evening, you're going to call in. And if not, there's three others of you that will be. That's not a place for us. You know, right. it really needs to be uh, supported by by senior management. Okay. Well, that actually leads me to another question. And and you've heard this statement, and, and I've heard it numerous, numerous times, I mean, thousands of times, looking for work-life balance. I mean, we all yeah. kind of strive for that, and especially, I think, today, and in, in, I'll call it the gig economy, where, mm. where people are out, you know, doing their own thing. But just in general, um, it, it, that strive to have that balance, but it's much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try, I, we, my wife and I talk about it all the time. And we talk about it every month because every month we don't achieve it. <laughs> so how are companies uh, working towards finding, helping their employees find that balance? And do you have any suggestions or tips actually for an employer or for uh, an employee to look at to consider how do I achieve that? Yeah, absolutely. I teach uh, work-life balance, time management, uh, especially with the universities. Every university has a time management, work-life balance program. And what it comes down to is a reductive mindset. We think, you know, I think anyway, 85 to 95 percent of the things that I do are necessary. And mm -hmm. most people think that. They think, right. well, I just don't have the space. But we really do. We really do have the space. And so what I do is um, is show them. You know, we'll do, um, gosh, I think I was just telling you, I, I teach next week for a, a big group. And I sent this survey over before saying how much time is spent in meetings? How much time is spent in on email? Just CC'd and FYI. And, and we're looking for where we can pull back. Where can, be re, where can we be reductive? How many meetings do we really have to be in? Do I have to be in that meeting? Could maybe just pop in and be right, right. for half of it and so we look at things that we can reduce uh, we we show people how to really focus on um, what is really important here when is good enough good enough like for myself mm -hmm. I'm a perfectionist and so I will rework a deck several times sure. but then I have to really look at myself and think hey am I part of the problem am uh -huh. I slowing things down here sure. what do people really need to know and so it's it's doing the time study that's super important. It's you know really realizing where your time is, time, um, where it's being spent. Then taking a look at do I have options to be flexible with my employees where they work? Could they actually work from home? Right. Would they get more done? Could we you know change the hours where people are coming in for work so that we're not putting them through crazy traffic and then they get here and they're stressed out and you know, what can we do to help people be more effective? Do you find that um, telecommuting is is on the rise for a lot of different companies? And do you find with, you, with your experience with the organizations that you work with that it's a type of company that embraces kind of that telecommuting or flexibility and in, in, in work? Well, what I'm seeing is that companies that are aware of employee wellness and, and the impact of their company are much more open with flexible work arrangements, which is which is great. You know, okay. that could be telecommuting, which is fantastic. It could be flexible hours of start and stop. Uh, it, it looks like um, what meetings do you have to be in just like like I was mentioning to you it's um we really don't want to have the company too spread out the employees too spread out from each other because the number one aspect of having a happy workforce is social connectivity they need to feel that they're important that they're part of something otherwise it's very easy for people to say well this is okay until something better comes along but when you have roots at the company when you have friends when you have social aspect you are more tied to that organization right. than just leaving for the next shiny object sure it, and i i always liken it to um 
getting them engaged, right? Making yeah. them feel that they're, they're, they're investing and having a say in their future, right? Because now they've bought into what's going on. They were part of that decision process, mm -hmm. right? And so they're helping to shape how things go forward. And I, and I think that's also part of it. There's, you know, that culture of, and, and, and if we talk about company culture a little bit, I mean, there's that immersion, if you will, in the company culture and helping to shape to be more employee centric, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, we want customer centricity, of course, but a lot of times the employees get left behind. As a, in marketing, a lot of times we're so focused on our external activities, right? Whether it's a website or an email campaign or ad campaign. And I always tell the client, we also have to market internally, right? The employees have to know there's nothing worse than employee finding out that there's some big event or something going on with the company or new initiative. And, oh, by the way, we didn't know about it. And when somebody asked them or their customer calls and said, hey, I hear you guys are doing something. And they go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That, I think, has a, a, a ding, if you will, against, you know, really feeling part of the organization, which in turn, I think, leads maybe to satisfaction. Why am I not included? Those kinds of things. It's such a common such a common statement, which is so unfortunate, you know. What we will do when we kick off a program is, um, you know, maybe it's um, it's an activity, you know. Uh, for example, there there's one um, program that we kick off, and everybody gets a little tracker, and their calories are tracked, right? Okay. Now, with those calories, say, you know, you today burned off 500 calories. I wish. <laughs> so, you know, I, I burned a thousand. You burn five, I burn a thousand. So now what happens is as um, that 500 or a thousand goes to a organization that gives protein packs, like peanut butter packs, for 5, 500 and a thousand to a starving child that is malnourished wow. in a third world country. So now what we're doing to kick off our wellness program is we are saying, hey, we want to do good, which is what people want, especially mm -hmm. the millennials, they really want to feel like they're changing the world, which is awesome. But we also want to be connected as a team, right? And we want to show empathy for each other. Right. So when we kick off this 30 day program and people are moving and they're, they're getting healthier, their endorphins go up and now they can track it. And now they're, those calories have gone to help someone else. That's a culture that didn't exist before. That's yeah. a big movement. That's social connectivity. That's helping others. It's kindness. And that's the start of creating a great culture. Do you find that more in, from a cause-related standpoint with, with millennials than Gen Xers or boomers? I would say more, yes, yeah. Uh, I am seeing that the millennials, they're a super bright, great group. They have purpose, you know, which is fabulous. But still, you know, there are, um, of all ages, right. really want to feel like they're doing something worthy. I'm not a millennial, and it m makes me very happy to know that I'm helping out sure. somebody that needs help. Well, that's really interesting, and I, I think from, a, uh, from a, a company perspective, a few years ago, I was working with an organization, and I can't remember the program they had in place, but, you know, we, we could take our our gym activity and right and we could send them reports and they would log it in and eventually you could win prizes and all this kind of stuff and i was really surprised at the number of people that were doing this just because they wanted to win something but we weren't really giving to anybody else and i think that's a really maybe an interesting change um in motivation for people to really think about happiness mm -hmm. and how their happiness can help spread happiness to other folks yeah happiness is contagious yeah. So there's that old statement, right? Uh, it's it's you can be successful and not be happy, but you can success if you can be happy and successful at the same time. I mean, that's the great combination that we want everybody to to experience. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I um, when I was doing this work, you know, on my on my education to be able to teach the science of happiness, which rolled out into employees and workplace, because that's my background. It's mm -hmm. all you know, workplace work. And um, the science of happiness is Yale's number one most popular class. And the, the science... The university. The right university, okay. yeah. That's where I took mine. Okay. And the science shows that if you are focused on success, to your point, you will not be happier. But if you're focused on happiness, then your success levels soar. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. The... Um, you know, it, it's one of the things that I was looking at and just kind of looking that idea of uh, 
happiness and a correlation between ha what is we're talking about happiness, success, and productivity. Is there uh, any other uh, information or insights you have on that? And, and how do companies really work that correlation and pay attention, right? I put a program in place and it should be implemented, but who drives that? Who, who ensures that that is being implemented to its fullest as far as you know, from your experience? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's all kinds of bottom line numbers when you track it. The problem is, you know, in my business mind anyway, the problem is people aren't tracking it. You got to track this. This is an investment. You need to track it and make sure it's got a ROI, right? It's got a VOI, value on investment, mm -hmm. but the ROI is there too. So we need to realize that, you know, um, the people that typically are in charge of this is typically the HR group. And, you know, and that's difficult. And that's why, it, you know, I love coming in because I want people to be happy. But I also have a big background in this and I can help them, you know, roll those programs out if they need to. Our team can help them roll those programs out. Um, so, you know, what we're looking at is, is. Um, medical, we're looking at stress management, we're looking at activity, we're looking at uh, connectivity, uh, building great co-worker relationships. So there's a lot to it. Now, so if I'm a small business, mm -hmm. you just painted a big picture mm -hmm. and something that's, I'm going to say, I don't know if I can afford all that stuff or frankly, have the time or the bandwidth to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think, to re, you know, as long as you're not a solopreneur and you've got any kind of employees, I mean, ultimately, you don't want turnover. And, and so how do you how do you work with an organization or or what should organizations look look at when they're considering these programs as far as what's is there a priority that this is kind of the first step you need to do or the second step? And so let's give them some tips and tricks, if you will, and things that they should consider when they start thinking about these kinds of programs. It's, uh, you can have a, a well, happiness program, an employee culture program, whatever you want to call it, you know, at any level. That might be that you have standing desks, that, you know, you stand for half the time, you sit down for half the time. Your meetings could be that you go for a walk and you record it. That's what I do. And, okay. You know, we, we walk. Uh, you could have potlucks, healthy events. You could do something. You go build a, a house for a habitat. You can do as much or as little as you want. If your employees are just showing up and they don't have the energy and they're not engaged and you're trying to roll out new programs and they are not you know, behind that, you've got the going out of business business plan. You got to right. do something. Now, that's interesting. So if the employees are not behind it, but what about management that's not behind it? Right. As, so as a manager, sorry to cut you off. That's okay. As a manager, if you're seeing that your team is not running, you got to do something. Okay. You got to get buy-in. But as a as a manager, as an owner, as you know, the person that's responsible, you know, you're a servant, servant leadership, right? You got to help them get there, and that's when you, you know, ideally, you're giving them the option for a wellness program. Okay. You know, you, you said something earlier, and let's. Let's talk about employee turnover a little bit. And certainly mm -hmm. there's lots of costs that go with onboarding an individual and, and looking at the tenure of someone if they're in and out very quickly because they were unhappy or, frankly, you brought in the wrong people. But, you know, from that happiness standpoint, if people aren't don't have that job satisfaction, right, we said a little bit earlier, 70% of the American workforce is disengaged or unhappy in their job. Mm -hmm. So what does that cost? Do you have any numbers that translate that, that – <sighs> that the audience can you really kind of put into practical use in the sense of saying it's going to cost me X to onboard somebody. What kind of investment should I be making in their training and their happiness and welfare, uh, wellness to make sure that they don't leave? Right. Okay. So here's the, the stats on that. Uh, what we're seeing is 90 days after onboarding, people are jumping off. You know, they're gone. They don't like it. They're out of there. Typically, those people leaving are your high performers. High performers, great talent will not stay if it's not the culture that they want. You know, so the number one reason for them leaving, uh, for anyone leaving right now in an organization, is I don't see that there's any advancement for me, number one. Okay. Um, number two is uh, my boss, you know, is horrific. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, number three is this culture isn't doing it for me and they're out the door now to replace that person it's 40 percent of the salary yikes it's it's expensive so what happens is we replace then we turn over because we don't have those things in place 
But what I am seeing is yeah, I'm working with a lot of great companies that are training up the management team to be able to to be, you know, what these people need, you know, to be able to teach, to mentor, to coach, to, um, you know, have open communication. Okay. Um, we've got about five minutes left, so I, I want to look at, you know, what are what are some tips, if you can, you can provide businesses to help build employee satisfaction and or establishing a program to, to really get that foundation of, hey, I want to do something, but I don't really know what to do. You know, mm -hmm. what's kind of the minimum? We've already talked about all the different things we can do, but, you know, what's kind of that minimum in place to, to help evaluate and then help mm -hmm. get a program going? Well, first of all, I would suggest to uh, ask the employees what they want, okay. you know, because you don't want to roll something out and them thinking, oh, man. You it's know, engagement already, right? It, You're already it, making the right step in the right direction. Exactly. You know, where is their time going? What do they want? What would they think is fun? You know, and then from there, let's start, let's start doing things. What I I see a lot is one department doesn't respect what the other department is doing. Okay. You know, it's very easy to um, job shadow for a couple hours so that people see what everyone else is doing. That creates, you know, an environment of respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, that's, that's something that's important to do. You know, take a look at can we be flexible in our work hours? You know, can we um, have people start, you know, at, at different time so that they're not hitting that morning traffic right can uh is there one day a week that some people can work from home what are we going to do as a team what kind of a, you know event are we going to do socially are we going to invite the families now i've you know managed for many years and and i do both i do something with the team when they hit goals and then i also do events where i invite the family because if the family is not supportive right, then right. it's not going to be good for your star employee at work well i think that's that's a great um suggestion because obviously if the family's involved and there's that buy-in from everybody right and, and it's like hey john how can you not be happy this is a great place um, yeah. I, I think that's that's great i mean that's i think that's a a, a definitely something people should look at. Yeah. See, how we look at it is these are human beings. It is not going to be like um, a technology that you're going to turn it on and, and, you know, boom, you've got your result. Human beings take time. And we can't say, okay, we just did that. Be happy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to let them come around. And, and so we introduce two-minute exercises that are rewiring the brain to okay. think more positively. Okay. So we just can't p play Pharrell's song... Uh happy. That's right. <laughs> so uh, a couple minutes left. So you and I, obviously, we're in business. We, we run businesses. So um, this is for you. So when you think about growing your business, you know, what keeps you up at night? You know, what are your biggest challenges and obstacles to grow your business? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that because I am a perfectionist, it's probably the, the best asset, but it's also the worst. You know, I really have to watch myself and make sure that I'm not expecting too much. When people come uh, to me in an environment like this, they're not happy. I do a lot with uh, charities and, and caregivers, and, and that's that's a weight on me, you okay. know. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, my heart is in this business. I want people to be happy, and I know that they're I want, you know, that'll result in them being healthy. So I would say that probably what keeps me up at night is myself. Okay. <laughs> you have to work on that. Yeah. You know, that one of the things that uh, uh, a gentleman told me years ago, it, it was one of those evenings and I was stressing out about what was going on. And he said to me, is there anything you can do about the situation tonight that'll change it? And his answer was, my answer was No. And he said, then don't worry about it, just go to sleep. Yeah. So I always think about that when we start put those extra kind of pressures on ourselves again, what's keeping us up at night. Um, most of the time I sleep like a baby because I use that little bit of philosophy to, to uh, put everything else out of my mind. So thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. So let's give me, uh, tell the listeners how they can reach you and how they can find you online and all those wonderful things. Yeah, no, that would be great. I'd, I'd love to uh, chat with people. The uh, website for us is happyandhealthy.biz. 
I'm also on LinkedIn. Okay. And so feel free if you get on the website, you can. Uh, there, I think the first big button you see is chat now, <laughs> and you can uh, you can contact us there that way. Okay, and and we didn't mention it, but you're also. Uh, on a TV show as well? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm definitely on the happy and healthy bandwagon. I'm on the Wellness Hour. I have a segment, uh, Happy and Healthy with Nancy Drew. Okay. So. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it, and I'm sure the audience definitely got some tips out of this and uh, look forward to continuing our relationship and working together. So uh, thank you again for joining us at the cafe. You can find out more about me and the Ponzi Group at uh, www.theponzigroup.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. And certainly I encourage you to subscribe to this podcast at uh, the Business Growth Cafe.podbean. We look forward to meeting up again next week where we'll explore the world of finances and not, how not knowing your numbers can have an impact on your business. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com. He used to pester me for a walk. Now, it's the other way around.